we're going to be going to heaven in a few minutes because Jesus is going to reset our perspective on things that matter versus things that don't matter. So uh, let's get our, our uh, bearings straight on where we are. We're in John chapter 6, and the entirety of John chapter 6 uh, takes up about a 24-hour period, from verse 1 all the way through the end of John chapter 6. Uh, if you were with us the, in the first message in John chapter 6, Jesus had fed the 5,000 men, plus women and children, somewhere on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, near the city of Tiberias. We know that because the Bible tells, that, it tells us that. We also know from conservative figures, it'd be men plus women and children, probably about 25,000 people is what Jesus fed with two fish and some loaves of bread. Remember that? Okay, that was in one day. That very night, the people got, the disciples, excuse me, got on a boat similar to what you get on today if you go to Israel, as, as you re-experience what the apostles did. Uh, the disciples, they got on a boat, and they went to sail to the other side, from Tiberias over to uh, Capernaum. But Jesus, he was on a mountain praying. Remember that? Okay, that was from last time. What happened? The disciples are caught in a storm on a boat at night on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus walks to them on water. And then they're able to safely get to the other side, and they land in the area of Capernaum. And that is where we pick up our story here. John chapter 6, verse 22, the Bible tells us this. On the following day, so in other words, the day after he fed the 25,000 people, and the day after, the night of, when Jesus walked on the water and the disciples were in the storm. The next day, in other words, the next morning, maybe noon, we don't know exactly what time. But on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other boat there. In other words, when the people who were fed the fish and loaves, when Jesus did the miracle, when they saw the boat was gone, the boat that the disciples were in was gone. This will all come together in a second. They saw there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. Again, remember, Jesus was up on the mountain praying. They saw the disciples get into the boat alone without Jesus. That's what that's referring to. That's what this, so the people, they ate the day before. They're thinking, wait a minute, now it's the next day. The boat's gone. Jesus was up on the mountain praying. Jesus is gone. Verse 23. However, other boats from Tiberias, near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks, when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they also got into boats, and they came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So you got that? So they wake up in the morning, the boat's gone, the disciples were in the boat. They knew Jesus wasn't in that boat. Jesus had gone up on the mountain to pray. But when they got up in the morning, the boat's gone, the disciples are gone, Jesus is not there. Uh-oh, where did Jesus go? So they get in other boats that are in Tiberias, they hijack them, and they take the boats to go and track down Jesus, and they track Jesus down over in Capernaum. You guys got that? Okay, hey, verse 25. And when they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, in other words, when they found him in Capernaum, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus is never going to answer their question, when did you come here? He never says, well, last night I walked on the water, then got in the boat, and we came here. He doesn't say that. He's never going to answer their question. But this is what Jesus is going to do. The first thing he does, three main points, he's going to set the priority. From the surface with these people, they appear to be genuinely seeking after Jesus. They wake up in the morning, they are looking for him. So much are they seeking for him, they are working hard. They get into boats and they row the boats all the way over to the other side where Jesus was. But Jesus knew their hearts. Jesus knew they weren't interested in him as a savior of their sins. They didn't want to hear a message that they were sinners in need of salvation, in need of forgiveness. Jesus knew their hearts, and he knew that what they wanted was another magic show. They wanted another free meal from Jesus. Yesterday, that was cool. You took the fish and loaves, and you fed 25,000 people. What are you going to do for us today? That's why they followed him, and Jesus knew this. 
in setting the priorities and in looking at these people here in John chapter 6, we're reminded of this passage from the book of Philippians where the Apostle Paul wrote, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. It was Jesus himself who said, If you are not for me, you are against me. These people, as we're going to see, um, by the time you get to the end of chapter 6, we're not going to go all the way there today, but you see, they were not for Christ. In fact, they were enemies of Christ. All right? Now, Paul goes on to write this, and this describes the heart of these people. He goes on to say in Philippians, he said, Their end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. This would be these group of people that are seeking Jesus on that day. Their God is their belly. We want some more fish. We want some more bread. You did that for us yesterday. Now do it again today. And their mind is set on earthly things. What are you going to do for us now? But Paul goes on and we have this contrast. Paul goes on in Philippians chapter 3 and he says, for those who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, our citizenship is in heaven. Now to me that's really encouraging. Because I know, when you, when you start looking at it, um, I, I can think of the words of the psalmist, where the psalmist cried out, he said, Lord, I don't get it, I've followed you. This is the TIV version, uh, Tom's international version. Lord, I, I don't get it, I, I, I cry out, I follow you, I keep the Sabbath, I do all the things I'm supposed to do, and yet, I've got trials, I've got tribulation, I have difficulties, and then I look at those who don't follow you, Lord, they're blessed! They got mansions, they got food, they got all the good stuff. And then the psalmist comes to the end and he says, but then I saw what the end was going to be. And then he praises God. Because he realized, even though this isn't said in the Old Testament, this is in the New Testament, he realized my citizenship is in heaven. Sometimes we can look at, at, at things and we can start to be a little bit discouraged as believers. And we can say, Lord, I don't get it. Uh, you know, these people are being blessed, and those people are being blessed, and they get this, and they get that, and I serve you. And, and my thing, Lord, I, I just don't understand. I followed you all my life. I could be living right there in La Jolla, California. You move me to Hemet. How? I love you. Right? I know how the Hemet conversations have gone. I've talked to some of you. Listen. If you know Christ, you have a mansion in heaven that he has built for you. And I can tell you something, he's a better builder than any contractor that this world ever has. Some of you may be contractors. That's awesome. But you're not as good as Jesus is building heaven. That's all I got to say. We have a mansion in heaven. You may be thinking, well, I don't get invited to the fancy wedding feasts and the fancy reception. I never get invited to the fancy parties or none of that. If you are in Christ, guess where you get to go? You get to go to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Woo! Do you have any idea? Have you ever read the Bible and been able to figure out what that is going to be like? You are at dinner with the King of Kings. You are a prince, you are a princess there at the wedding supper of the Lamb. You, have, you might not have fancy dishes here. In heaven, oh, 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 fancy dishes doesn't even begin to describe it. And food, oh my is right, it's third service. And food is going to be <laughs> off the charts good. I, I, I think of food this morning, my son, he got a maple bar, one of those donuts. I can't eat maple bars. I got this problem, right? I eat maple bars, it, 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 it's a problem. But in heaven, oh, I can imagine what a maple bar is going to be like in heaven. I can, uh, enchiladas? Tamales, anybody? Yeah. Cheeseburgers? Oh, I hit the wrong, I'm so sorry. I... And for vegetarians, carrots? I'm sorry. I have, I have, I'm not kidding you. I don't know what it is about me, but I attract vegetarian friends. It's like half my friends are vegans. I'm like, how could you do such a thing? Why would you do such a thing? And then they look at me. That is why we do what we do. 
But Jesus is resetting their priorities. You're thinking of earthly things. You need to think of heavenly things. For us, our citizenship is in heaven for those who know Christ. But for them, their God is their belly. And in the next few verses, Jesus is going to be talking about the spiritual. They're going to be connecting only with the physical. He's going to be talking about the things of heaven. Uh, they're going to only be thinking about the things of earth. He's going to be thinking, talking about that which lasts forever. They're only going to be able to connect with the things that are temporary, that don't last. So they say to him, again in verse uh, 25, when did you get over here, Rabbi? We've been looking all over for you. We rode the boats over here. You fed us some great meals yesterday. What are you going to do for us today? That's where this is going. So Jesus answers and says to them, most assuredly I say to you, you don't see, seek me uh, because you saw the signs. In other words, you're not seeking me because you saw the signs appointed to me being the Messiah. That is not why you're following me. But you seek me because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Because you got a free meal yesterday and you want another one today. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. Because God the Father has set a seal on him. So they said to Jesus, what shall we do that we may do the works of God? Uh, they sound holy again, like we're really seeking you. Yeah, yeah, right. And Jesus answers and says to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Believe in me. Therefore, they said to Jesus, here's where their heart starts to be revealed. Therefore, they said to Jesus, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Jesus yesterday just fed 25,000 people with two fish. That was pretty good. Today they're saying, uh, do it again. Do something better. They want better. Verse 31, they say, Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread... Of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, oh, give us this bread always. Lord, that is what we want. Jesus is resetting their, uh, or, or attempting to reset their priorities. Jesus, in the whole conversation, he's talking about the spiritual and the heavenly and eternal life. And they are only thinking what are you going to do for me today? You did that yesterday. What are you going to do for me today? Give us this bread always that we may, in other words, that we won't even have to go get any bread in this world anymore. They're only thinking about the world. First takeaway at this point is this. Be rich toward God. Jesus is resetting their focus on that which lasts, as I mentioned, forever. Uh, he's trying to get them to understand, even with the principle of what it means to be heavenly minded enough that you store your treasure in heaven. Let, let me use this to illustrate this point for you. And I shared parts of this before. This, this time I'll put it, read the whole context of it. But um, this author writes, some people have a gift for acquiring stuff. Not long ago, I took my daughter to a place called Hearst Castle. Anybody been there? I've been there a few times. William Randolph Hearst was a stuffaholic. He had 3,500-year-old Egyptian statues, medieval Flemish tapestries, and centuries-old hand-carved ceilings and some of the greatest works of art of all time, most of which came from Sweden. He built, get this, a 72,000-square-foot house. Now, you guys aren't impressed. You guys got houses that big? To me, a 7,200-square-foot house is pretty big. This is a 72,000-square-foot house. I'm just saying that's really big. All right, you guys got big houses. I get it. So he built a 72,000-square-foot house to put his stuff in. He acquired property for his house, 265,000 acres, and he originally owned 50 miles of California coastline. He collected stuff for 88 years. And then you know what he did? 
You guys are good. All three servants. And then he died. This author puts it, that was short-sighted. Now people go through her house by the thousands. They all say the same thing. Wow. He sure had a lot of stuff. People go through life. They get stuff. And then they die, leaving all their stuff behind. What happens to it? The kids argue over it. The kids who haven't even died yet who are really just pre-dead people, could go, go over to their parents' house. They pick through their parents' old stuff like vultures, deciding which stuff they want to take to their houses. They say to themselves, now this stuff is my stuff. And then they die. If some new vultures come for it. People come and go. Nations go to war over stuff. Families are split apart because of stuff. Husbands and wives argue more about stuff than any other single issue. Prisons are full of secret things, of street, excuse me, prisons are full of gangs and CEOs who committed crimes to acquire stuff. Jesus is resetting their mind to be rich toward God. What they wanted was a fish maker and a bread baker. So they track him down. Appearing religious on the outside. They get up early. They're looking for Jesus. They row hard to the other side. They find Jesus. Oh, when did you get here? We missed you. You only missed me because of the stuff I did for you yesterday. So when they say, when did you get here? He doesn't answer them. Instead, he answers why they came. Most assuredly, Jesus said in verse 30, I say to you, verse 26, you seek me not because you saw the signs, not because you knew I was the Messiah, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Because of the stuff I did yesterday. Your mind is set on things below. Jesus then says, don't labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. In other words, don't live only for food or whatever that is here today and gone tomorrow. Uh, Don't live for the things of this world, but live for that which lasts forever. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, uh, he says this way, he said, store your treasure in heaven. To help us, I'm going to help us work through this for about a minute. Um, I'm going to encourage you to do this. You don't have to do it now, but I encourage you to do it maybe even this afternoon or tonight. Get a piece of paper. This is all on your own between you and the Lord or you and your friends, you and your family, whatever you want to do. And, and get a piece of paper and make a column. So you have two columns. At the top of one side, put forever. At the top of the other side, put temporary. And then start to put in the forever column the things that matter forever. Put in the temporary column the things that are temporary. It'll help you as you see physically with your eyes, as you get your priorities adjusted on that which is forever and that which does not. That which matters, that which matters most, and the things that really don't matter much in the long run. Um, At the top of the forever column, obviously God is there, and your relationships with other people are going to be there. Because the Bible even tells us, how can you love God who you can't see when you don't even love your own brother who you can see? If you really love God, you're going to love other people, right? Or as one person said it this way, we make a living by what we get, we make a life by what we give. So uh, here's here's a great exercise. You get some Post-its, right? And this is what you do. You take a Post-it, On one post-it, you write the word forever. And you go up to somebody that you love, your children, your spouse, whoever it may be, and you take that post-it, you put it right on their forehead. (laughs) And they say, gee, thanks, Dad, now I look like a dork. But hey, you're forever, right? (laughs) And then you go over to your your, your TV, and you put temporary, right? Um, Your your furniture, temporary. And your car, somewhere on your dash, temporary. And it starts to help you to get refocused as Jesus is attempting to, to uh, 
get us refocus. He's setting the priority for these people. These people aren't going to get it. They totally aren't going to get it. We'll really see that next time. But, but I've read ahead. They're, they're not going to get it. Um, but to help us understand a little bit further, let me illustrate this same principle with this, and then we'll move on. This author writes, you'll get inundated with messages that try to get you to obsess over the outer you. Experts tell us that if you exercise regularly, you will add two years to your life. But the bad news is that you will spend those two years exercising. Now I know I'm committed to go back to the gym, and yeah, I, 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 get, I get this. Winston Churchill lived into his 90s and said the only exercise he ever got was serving as a pallbearer for his friends who died while they were exercising. <laughs> you gotta love that. <laughs> Some of you, that's gonna click later, and then you're gonna think, hey, that was funny. That's all right. Some people are a little slower than others. Um, then it continues, be grateful for the outer you. Come to peace with your body. Rejoice in its strengths. Accept its limitations. Be grateful for it. Wash it every once in a while. Let it work hard. Be happy when it gets promoted. But remember, it's wasting away. Jesus is letting them know, you guys live for the food that perishes. The things of this world. Listen, we need food. We need clothes. We need a place to live. We, we live in a culture. You need, uh, you need transportation. You need a, you need a, you need a phone. You know, can you imagine living without a cell phone anymore? A few years ago, we didn't even know what they were. Now you can't live without them. Uh, so there are certain things that are needs, right? We get that. But this is understanding uh, still where you set your heart and the things that matter versus the things that really don't matter. So Jesus is setting the priority, and then he comes to the second thing as he addresses their problem. Uh, again, verse 28, they said to him, what shall we do that we may do the works of God? This is very similar to what the rich young ruler said to Jesus when he said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Right? So they say, what's the good work that we can do that we would do the works of God? Here's the work of God, verse 29, that you believe in me. There's... a uh, really only two sets of works of human beings that will go into heaven. It's the, the works that are centered on the things that go into your forever column, those things you do that matter forever, that have God at first, the things you do because you love God, that go there. At the top of your forever column, it's God. Others, and I don't know where you fit on your forever column. Um, so two sets of human works go with us forever is that and the other set of human works that are going to be in heaven are the nail piercings in Jesus' feet, his hands, the sword piercing in his side. We're going to see that. We know because in the Bible, in his glorified body, those things exist. Uh, the, I would imagine where his crown of thorns was pressed into his head, we'll see those marks too the marks that bought us our salvation. He paid a price for us that we would be forgiven. So he says, here's the work. You believe in me. But they didn't catch on. So they say to him, um, give us a sign. Right? We just read that. He gave them, he fed the thousands of people the day before. They're saying, that's not good enough. Give us another sign. We want we want something more. So they said to him in verse 30, what sign will you perform then? That was what you did yesterday. What sign are you going to perform now? That we may see it and believe you. What work are you going to do today? That was yesterday, Lord. Give us some more. They want a lot more. Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. What were they referring to? Moses, for 40 years, gave us bread from heaven. You fed us one day, one meal. Moses, 40 years. If you're really, you know it, you got to one-up Moses. We want to see 
more. We need more. Second takeaway. More will never be enough. If you know anybody that's an alcoholic, then, and, they, and they've gone to some type of group to get to help them through that process. Um, there's a saying, a one is too many, a thousand is not enough. You know what that's referring to? One drink is too many because one drink is going to set them on the course. A thousand wouldn't be able to satisfy them, right? Uh, but that applies to everything and to everybody, not just to the person who has a problem with drinking. It applies to everybody. The person who has a problem with greed. A thousand dollars is too many. A million dollars is not enough. Can't stop, can't stop, can't stop, right? The person who has a problem with sex. A one, one night stand is too many, but a hundred of them is not enough. It's, it's never gonna, going to satisfy. More will never be enough. In John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he said this, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Do you remember that in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well? So she's looking for physical water. These people are looking for physical food, right? Very similar things. He gives them basically the same answer. And, and they both say the same thing. The woman at the well, when she heard this, she said, oh, give me some more of that water. Woohoo! Then I'll never have to draw water again. They're saying, we want some of this food that you're going to give us. Oh, yeah. The problem is, the woman at the well, the light went on. Bada boom, bada bing. The light went on. She got it. She got saved. The Lord was dwelling in her. In her is overflowing with the Spirit of the Lord. She goes back and tells everybody in the village about the Lord. Remember that? These people are not going to ever make the spiritual connection. What they want is more. You did this yesterday. Now we need more. More will never be enough. The best of fishing trips must be followed by another fishing trip. The win at the casino must be followed by another win. The most exquisite meal still leaves you hungry. You can wear the fancy of, uh, of clothes today, but you're going to need new fancy clothes again next year. It's like a Chinese dinner. You go out, you get really, really full. A couple hours later, you're going, man, I'm hungry again. Right? Right? more will never be enough. And that is what Jesus is letting them know. I'll give you food, and you're going you're to have to worry about this anymore. Oh, yeah! They're thinking physical. They're not thinking eternal. They're thinking earthly. They're not thinking of heaven. Uh, third takeaway, don't be shallow. You know shallow people? We all know shallow people. Some of your friends probably think you might be shallow. I don't know. But we all know shallow people. Uh, there was a movie out several years ago. I think it was called Shallow Howl or something like that. I didn't see the movie, but the title just makes sense. Because we know what the word shallow means when it comes to us and who we are. Jesus is taking them to the deep things, the deep truths. Don't be shallow about the things of this world. And what he's really seeing is this. Don't be shallow with God. He said to them, I say to you, verse 32, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. It's not about the earthly thing, it's about the heavenly thing. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread. Always, they are shallow people. It's, they can't see beyond the things of this earth, beyond the things of this um, world. In 1965, Somerset Maham was 91 years old and fabulously wealthy. Royalties were continuing to pour into him even when he was 91 years old. He was receiving 300 letters a week from his fans. And even at 91, even though he hadn't written things in a long time, he was experiencing incredible success. But what did that success mean to him? His nephew, Robin, was a believer in Christ and he visited his uncle shortly before his, his uh, death, and he wrote this. I looked around the drawing room at the immensely valuable furniture and pictures and objects that his success had enabled him to acquire. 
I remembered that the villa itself and the wonderful garden I could see through the windows, a fabulous setting on the edge of the Mediterranean was, for the most part, priceless. He had 11 servants. He dined on silver plates. He was waited on by his butler and by his footman. But it no longer meant anything to him. The, the following afternoon, he said, I found him reclining on the sofa, peering through his spectacles at a Bible which had very large print. He looked horribly wizened. In other words, he saw the Bible, he looked at his life, and he, looked, he had this horrible look like, uh-oh. And his face was grim. I've been reading the Bible you gave me, and I've come across the quotation, What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I must tell you, my dear Robin, that the text, that text used to hang opposite my bed when I was a child, and of course it's just a bunch of bunk. But the thought is quite interesting to me all the same. That evening, in the drawing room after dinner, he flung himself down onto the sofa. Oh, Robin, I'm so tired. And he gave a gulp and he buried his head in his hands. And said, I've been a failure the whole way through my life. I've made mistake after mistake. I've made a hash of everything. I tried to comfort him, said Robin. You're the most famous writer alive. Surely that means something. I wish I'd never written a single word, he answered. It's brought me nothing but misery. Everyone who's gotten to know me has ended up hating me. My whole life has been a failure, and it's now too late to change. It's too late. He looked up, and his grip tightened on my hands. He was staring towards the floor. His face was contorted with fear, and he was trembling violently. His face was ashen as he stared in horror, ahead of him suddenly he began to shriek go away go away he cried i am not ready yet i am not ready to die his high-pitched voice terror struck seemed to echo from wall to wall go away i'm not ready to die he said he looked around the room he didn't see anybody there he asked him what he see he saw in his mind some spiritual being getting ready to take him to his doom. Horrified. I I don't know what happened to him in his last hours. That I don't know. Um, But at that point, he was a man who had fame and fortune, dined with princes, a man who had everything. He came to the time of reckoning for his soul, and he found his life empty and worthless and afraid to die. We don't have to be there. Jesus is resetting the priorities. Um, Jesus came to give life. So he says, I am the bread of life that has come down from heaven. Some people come to this point, even at church, and they, if they're honest with themselves, when they do the evaluation, they can say, my life, has been a sham. And Jesus is calling. He's saying, man, I will give you life. I'll give you forgiveness. I'll give you hope. You can know that you are a citizen of heaven because he gives us the last thing is the promise. Verse 35, Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you don't believe. All, listen to this, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me that all he has given me I should lose nothing but raise them up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's a promise. I want you to look at this. Verse 37. Now this is, this is really simple. This is real simple, folks. Ready? Verse 37, Jesus says, All the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will no ways cast out. All. How many is all? That was, you know what? First and second service, they couldn't get that. It was so hard. Verse 39. This is the will of the Father that 
all he has given to me I shall not lose. How many is all? Oh. Verse 40, this is the will, this is the Father's will. Everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have everlasting life. All. All. Everyone. None will perish. Listen, people say that you can lose your salvation. If I thought I could lose my salvation, I would be a mess. Because I lost it during first service. <laughs> and, and, I mean, I would have. I mean, with some of the things, listen, sometimes you say things, I mean, could you imagine saying something that you just shouldn't say? Or, you know, just, you, you, know I mean, you don't have to go into any details. But listen, all right, I mess up. Anybody else in here mess up? Okay, praise the Lord. Could you imagine every time you mess up, which is probably for most of us at least once a day, even as a Christian, I used to mess up a thousand times a day. Now I mess up less, right? But every time you mess up, you think, oh, I lost my salvation. That would be, I would hate living that way. I couldn't live that way. He says, all who come to me, all who come to me, everyone who comes to me, none will perish. I will not lose one. I can get lost. I can get all messed up. He ain't going to lose me. Does it make sense? He will lose none. All, all, everyone. Now he says to this, I realize I'm going over a couple of minutes, but I'm so close to being done, I think it'll be worth it. Literally, only a couple of minutes. He says, all who come to me. That word come, it means to forsake the old life of sins, right? And submit to him as Lord. It, the word come to Jesus, it literally conveys repentance. Repent is to make a U-turn, right? You turn from your sin and self, and you turn to the Lord. You come to me, you will not perish. I will not cast you out. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, you and your sins must separate or you and your God will never come together. I love how he says that, right? Come to me. And then he also says, he who believes in me, everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have everlasting life and he'll raise him up the last day. The word believe is to trust completely in him. Uh, the result is that you will not be cast out or as it says in the ESV version, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I'll close with this illustration. Years ago in the Midwest, there was an old German farmer by the name of Klein. He was an ungodly man. Although he lived across the street from an evangelical church, he never went in, and of course, he did not believe the gospel. To his way of thinking, the gospel was for other people, not for him. One day, however, the Bible school of the church began to teach the children the chorus of the hymn that goes, Grace, tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound, and all the earth shall hear. Saved by grace alone, this is all my plea. Jesus died for all mankind, and Jesus died for me. From his listening post across the street, Mr. Klein heard the children sing, and he mo heard most of the words clearly. But when they came to the line, Jesus died for all mankind, he thought they were singing, Jesus died for old man Klein. <laughs> and Jesus died for me. Mr. Klein ended up going over to the church, and after some time there, he ended up giving his life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and forgiven. <laughs> Jesus died for old man Klein, Jesus died for all mankind. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for anyone who wants to be forgiven of their sin. Um, he will in no way cast out anyone who comes to him. I'm